Hi. Hi. Just so you know, we can't see you, but I just, um, I opened up all the mics, so open mic for a few minutes. So if you want to ask some questions or just say hello. Test one, two. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, good. But look under your little speaker button and see that it's attached to the external microphone. Yep, looks like it is. Awesome. All right, I'm gonna send a few chats over here. Getting more and more high tech with each. Uh, with yeah. Each. We're learning a lot with you. So thanks for sticking by us. Wait, I'm. What's wrong? I don't know. Oh. What's going on, Carla? What can we help with? All right, we've got Casey. Yay, Casey's here. We miss you so much. She still Hi. has her mic mute. Oh, there she is. Hi guys, how are you? We miss you. I miss you, you. I miss all the pups. Yeah. <laughs> you don't miss us? I miss you too, I said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh my God, you guys have to see Curtis, he shaved everything because you know the the um barbers aren't open so he like literally cut his hair himself and cut his face you know all the oh beard my God. wow he looks like he's about 18 years old again <laughs> so i love it so i'm gonna disappear for a second okay so any questions before we get started we do we have a few minutes we still got four more minutes and then we'll kind of go into the format of the class and what to expect today. We were super excited putting this curriculum together. Yeah, I'm super excited. I was watching some of the old classes before this because I didn't, because I did register like for an account, but I didn't realize I had to register for the specific classes. So I think that's why I wasn't getting them before. But right. now that I'm like on that, I'll be able to go to each one. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to like Good. this and I sent it to my friend just got a dog I want to say a couple months ago so I sent them all to her as well so she oh, might awesome. join at some point but yeah ah, thanks Casey yeah of course Joanna's on hi Joanna hi <laughs> <laughs> thanks for showing up to our puppy class too that was awesome yeah it was really good good I'm glad you yeah, you guys are welcome to just I mean Oh, we got someone who raised their hand. Carla raised her hand. She's learning how to use this thing. Let's see. Oh, okay. I don't know what I did, but I unmuted her. Nope. Let's see. Looks like it's still muted. That's fine. All right. Carla, you um, can always type in the chat. So yeah, you can always use the chat to send us a quick message and we'll you can send it to all everyone, panelists and attendees, or just the panelists, which is um Julie and I are working in two different locations and we're gonna we're putting it the the presentation together. So we do have a message. Let's see. It says I am muted by the host. Okay, let me unmute you so you can chat for a little bit. Oops. All right. Yeah, we still have a couple of minutes. Does anyone have yeah. any questions about last week or your homework or any questions about your dogs this week? Because it's been, right, we're all cooped up inside. It's been a weird week. At least for us, it has been. So, um, does anyone have anything they want to ask or bring up about your dogs? Uh, Julie, that um, Ranger and Indy, e Indy are eating right next to each other now. Wonderful. I'm glad that we got that sorted out. Yeah, it, what you suggested worked. Like, he, Ranger yelled at him a little bit, and then he's he stopped bothering him. Yeah, and that's, you Just know. Just one time. Big brother, yeah, and it then it does uh, a lot of times it looks really scary um, for those of you that are on here. We're talking about older brother or sister dog correcting little dog, um, 
I myself am definitely not equipped to correct a dog because I do not speak dog, um, but my older dog does. And so when the little one's getting out of control or hitting her in the face, you know, it's really up to them to communicate to a certain point until it gets dangerous or persistent. Um, but I do encourage dog to dog communication as long as you are there to supervise is super important as well. Highly recommend those X pens and um, crates when you have multiple dogs, especially when it comes to feeding. Um, in our puppy start right next week, uh, we will be shooting some video on how to integrate um, resource guarding prevention, like we call it the bowl game. So I'll try it, if you guys remind me, I'll try to record the video and actually upload it to our Facebook group uh, page, that private group page so that you can kind of take a look at that video too. We also have a potty training ring the bell video that we shot that we haven't actually added to any of the webinars. So we might actually put that on our Facebook group page because some people were asking, you know, how do I teach my dog to cue me now that everyone's home? How do I teach the dog to cue me that they need to go outside and go potty? So it's a good time to implement any of those things since you're home, right? Oh, yeah. Good. Yeah, and for those of you that um, live in really nice big areas that are high traffic, um, this can be a perfect time to introduce your dog to that indoor or porch grass or um, bark potty that we demonstrate, um, especially if you or someone like you have a senior that you're living with, you have someone who um, is not as agile getting in and out with your dog or your puppy. Um, it's great to have a little side space, even if it's just a small grass patch. Um, and that's what the whole video is about. Lena, yes, your video is off and you're on mute, so you're all good. If no one's video, we can't see anyone. We just see your name. Um, and some of you are unmuted, so if um, I'm going to try to unmute all of you if you'd like to talk for a few minutes before we get started. And then when the webinar starts, everyone's typically muted. So we've got Jessa here. Hi, Jessa. Hi, Jessa. Hi, Jessa. <laughs> Hi. Yay. Oh, um, yeah. I actually have a quick question. Go for um, it. So Who is this? Oh, Casey. This is okay. Me. Um, so if my dog isn't used to me being home all the time, is there any chance, and now I'm like obviously with him all the time, is there any chance of like a separation anxiety or anything like that forming or is that not likely? Um, yeah, I, I, that's a really great question and, um, the, the, problem is yeah what happens when you go back to your regular life mm -hmm. right um we hopefully we won't be stuck like this for very much longer but at least another month so um maintaining your dog's regular schedule what you would do if you were in school or if you were um going to work mm -hmm. even if you're not leaving the house putting your dog up into a quieter space or giving them something to do during that time because dogs don't deal with a lot of change well. Um, and so when life goes, you know, rubber band and whips us back into what we're normal, our normal routine, and um, we wanna make sure that our dogs are prepared and their body cycle is prepared. They have their circadian rhythm down to sleep during the middle of the day um, and be active and awake with you guys in the morning and night. So you do wanna maintain um, a pseudo normal schedule, but um, don't, I think yeah. to answer her question, yes, dogs can start developing separation anxiety because they see you so much and then you're going to eventually leave again. So like Julie said, implementing your routine as much as possible. If your dog is left for the entire house, if you can go outside for a walk by yourself mm -hmm. um, and implement that routine that the dog is used to. If your dog is usually going in a crate, it's a good time to still give your dog some alone crate time so that they can really get some sound and good sleep. Um, a lot of uh, puppy parents um, earlier were just were asking the same thing. They're used to, you know, not being home and they're having to put their dog in a crate. So the question was, should I still be putting the dog in the crate? And the answer is yes. Try to stick to your routine as much as possible because consistency is really crucial for dogs to develop um, as well as they can. But 
isn't this awesome to be home with your dog all day? I, th- yeah, I think it's I love awesome. It. Cool. So, yeah, really, sorry, this is Jonna. Can I um, say what I usually do with Zena? Sure, I do. Recommendation. Um, I've been working from home, and Zena's pretty anxious now that I'm working from home, but her sign for me going out, including, because we still go out to the supermarket, is uh, we give her a treat. So every morning before we leave work, we give her and our other dog sugar a treat. So when we go to the supermarket, we do the same thing. We give them a treat and she's fine. She doesn't have any, I mean, she's four years old now, but I'm not anticipating any separation anxiety just because she really understands that if she doesn't see us going for the treat um, container, that means she's going with us. But if she sees us <laughs> go for the treat container, she's like, oh, okay. And she's still just as happy because she knows she's getting a treat and then, you know, we'll be gone. So, so that, that's kind of twofold. And one, I definitely like the idea that you're saying, hey, I'm leaving here, grab your popsicle, right? You're making it, make sure that it's a great experience. And we're going to touch on that in a little bit. Um, but you, you are leaving the house. You're deliberately leaving the house that so your dog's still spending some time alone. And that's kind of answering, going back to Casey's question. If you can somehow leave for five to 10 minutes, it doesn't even matter how long, even to your car to go get mail or um, just get out of the house for a little bit on your own so that your dog is okay being alone. Cool. Thank you. All right. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and mute everybody because we're gonna get started. Um, on our class. Today's class is, this class is for all of our student dogs. If you have a dog that's not a puppy, um, you wanna incorporate more of the training that you would in like your more formal obedience. So um, like an intermediate advanced um, obedience training, this is the class for you. But we've got some, we're touching up a little bit of management and other things that are gonna be on our webinar. A few few things. This is a webinar, so I can't, Julie and I cannot see or hear you, but we know you're there. <laughs> <laughs> so um, if you'd like to ask a question specifically, it, if it has to do with the topic, we can see the questions that you're asking to, you can just say to panelists or to panelists and attendees, and we'll try to answer them right then and there. If it's not something that's relevant, it's just a, a question that you have that you, you know, just thought, oh yeah, I forgot I have a question. We'll try to answer it at the end of class. Um, let's see what else. The class is gonna run for an exactly an hour. We'll try to like nail it down to an hour because we have another class at 6.30 and it's recorded. So you'll get an up, you'll get a, a link that you can watch a little bit later and see the class on your own time or if you wanna share it with somebody. What you can do for us, because these classes are free and we are asking um, if you can please snap a picture of us during class or if you've got a picture of your dog and share on social media using the hashtag Caning Learning Academy. We, um, since we are not charging, we are taking donations for people that still have a job that, are, um, that would like to donate, but you don't have to. This is part of our school curriculum. This is our way of saying thank you so much. You have so many choices. We really appreciate you being here. So um, that being said, anything else, Julie? No, thank you guys so much for tuning in and, and you know, being, up, being with us this week. We hope we can give you some really good new information and build upon what we did last week. So. Yeah, we, did, we, are, we do have a video of the settle on the mat, right? Isn't that in this curriculum that we put together that's increasing distance? Is that in this class? It's, yeah. It's, uh, right. it's, all right. All right. So class overview. Today we're going to, sh to talk and explain the different methods that we use at Canine Learning Academy. There's luring, which is treat to the nose and lure your dog into position, right? And then you have shaping, um, which is where we bring in the clicker or marker training. And then we have capturing, whereas you sit on the couch and you eat popcorn and you wait for it to happen. So we're going to explain to you those two, those three different training methods, and we're going to have you uh, assign some homework that you can implement those type of training if you've never done it before. We're going to dive deep into clicker training um, or marker training. Um, Julie is going to touch up with breed um, specific play, and you're going to learn a new breed um, or at least a breed group. Um, the go to the bed, the settle, or the go to the bed, or go to your spot that we did last week. We're going to build distance 
So we talked about distance away, like when you put them into the settle or into the spot and then you walk away, you come back, there's that kind of distance. But you also have the distance, which I, I think is just fun when you walk through the front door and you yell out, go to your bed and your dog just flies across the house and like jumps in their bed. So we're gonna show you how to implement that kind of distance on that particular behavior. Um, problem prevention, we have jumping, and at the very end, we'll go over any Q&A. Did I miss anything, Julie? No, you're all good. All right, training methods on you. So um, four kinds of training methods we're gonna go over. So luring, um, the number one, the way we see it a lot of times in videos it's taught is taking that treat up to your dog's nose and using it like it's a string. If you're pulling on that string, they're following you. Um, this is used especially for emergencies. We're gonna talk about this in our Rowdy Rover class, teaching new or novel tricks like look, you know, bow or roll over. Sometimes it's easier to lure than it is to capture. Um, and to change the position of your dog, if you're taking a lot of pictures, if you guys are in a, in a big area and if they're having trouble focusing, um, use that treat string on your dog's nose to kind of move them out of the way um, just really naturally without having to yank on the leash because then a lot of times that creates extra anxiety. Um, capturing, this is when we wait for it to happen and we capture it just like a camera. So we're gonna wait for something that your dog does pretty naturally like sitting, laying down. Um, my dog has a really cute head tilt, so does Yo's. Um, some dogs can do a lip lick, we teach that. Uh, there's Joanna all sorts had of- to do that. <laughs> yeah, some people, um, we, there was a really professional trainer that did a sneeze, he taught his dog to sneeze on cue. So um, these are things that happen throughout the day that you have the ability to capture, to market, and then reinforce it so that it happens more often. Um, and then using it through, through there. So shaping, talking about shaping, picturing a big block of clay, like you're, um, you're a sculptor. You're taking this big massive block and you're whittling it down piece by piece. You're shaping this beautiful picture into the end result. So you're starting with really, really broad goals for a down. It may just be the head dipping down instead of the whole body going into a down. Um, and we're getting small, small steps into that um, end goal or the end behavior we're looking for. So this is also really helpful when we're doing big behavior chains, like for service dogs um, or just brand new puppies teaching them a downer. Targeting, so one of our favorite ones that we use in Canine Learning Academy, not all training companies use this, but we particularly like it because you don't have to have anything in your hands, right? What happens on the day that you don't have a treat with you? Um, you're going to have a little more difficulty getting your dog's attention. So we have a target, meaning bring any part of your body that I say to an object that I'm pointing out. In some cases, it's going to be a nose touch. In some cases, it's going to be a high five. That's a paw target. Um, and last week we talked about settle on a mat. That's actually a body target. That's them taking their body and putting it on an object and us adding duration to that. So all of those methods we use pretty regularly. Um, targeting is for my dogs an especially helpful tool for anxiety. It can help redirect your dog or give them small accomplishable tasks. Um, but it's just a fun, it's also a fun way to teach tricks and spin and around and all these um, silly games we like to play. So Yo, do you want to add anything else to that? Um, the difference between luring and targeting, they both look exactly the same, except one has food in the hand and the other one, the dog has just learned to follow the target, the hand or whatever we're targeting in exchange for reward that is to come. Um, luring is faster when it comes to teaching tricks but the dog is literally just smelling the food and following it. So they're not really thinking. So although it's faster, it's not as retainable as when you're actually using shaping, capturing, or targeting. So a lot of trainers do use luring and I actually taught a lot of the beginning behaviors doing luring, but now my dog goes, if I just present 
my phone and I look at it, my dog is like, do you want me to put my paw, my nose, my, my body? Like he just goes through the whole list of things and waits for that, that mark. And, and then we go, okay, yeah, that was a good start. So let's go from there. So just a little bit about the difference. Some of you have heard me say um, that luring is a GPS, right? So if we're on a road back to our end behavior, um, luring is your GPS. You don't really have to know exactly where you're going. It's going to get you there. You don't really have to tune in or use your brain all that much. Um, but if we're targeting or if we're capturing, you really have to um, let the dog do more of the work. Um, and that's finding the direction. All right, let me go to the next slide. So to begin, we need to load a marker of some kind. So we use a clicker. A clicker is an acoustic sound that says, yeah, you did it. Hold on. Let me go get you a treat. Um, a verbal marker is ex works exactly the same way, except it's, um, it's a voice. It's your, it's your voice saying something. And the problem with that is that sometimes someone else in the house could use the same marker, but it sounds a little different. So it's not as precise. So either way, it means the same to the dog. It's just with clicker, we can really capture very small movements and move them into, and into the final behavior. So either way, whether you're using a verbal marker like, yes, you want it to be a word, a one syllable word that means you did it, hold on, let me go get food. Um, on this next video, we're going to show you how to pair up the food with your marker. Um, we've talked about this before. If you've taken our group manners class live in person, we talk about marking the behavior and then reinforcing it. So this is a little bit more about the marker. Um, to do loading of the marker or the clicker, you want to make the sound, whether it's the voice of yes or the, the click of your clicker, and then your hand moves and it gives the dog food. So it's the sound with food. And your goal is to pair the sound that your dog hears with the opportunity to get a reinforcement in just a second. Now, at first, you're going to do a lot of repetitions, like eight to 10 reps pretty, pretty quickly. You're going to notice in this video that Julie is trying to be very, very still so that the only thing that, um, this is Bentley, the only thing that Bentley really hears is the sound of, in this case, a clicker. And then her hand moves. And then you'll notice that she brings her hands back to default position. So it's click, treat down low, hands return to default. Click, treat down low, hands return to default. So this is my default position right here, um, but it could also be behind your back if that's a little more comfortable for you. We just don't want your hands dangling about because that's very distracting, kind of like flags in the air or drapes that are blowing. Your hands are just constantly moving and they're gonna be watching that instead of listening to you, which is the ultimate goal. In this case, after you've already loaded the clicker, one of the first things we ask you to do, um, ask our clients to do is cue your dog's name. So while the treat is down low, the dog's head is down. Now you'll say the dog's name. And when they're, when they're slowly moving up, even it's just a motion of moving, you're going to click and then you're going to bring that treat right back to your dog. So click, treat, back to default, whatever default looks like. So this is loading the clicker or loading your marker. It would look exactly the same if you were just using a verbal marker. It would be yes, your hand goes into the treat pouch, you deliver the treat, your hands go still. So one more thing I wanna tell you is that as soon as you move your hands to get that treat, the dogs anticipate, oh yeah, it's coming. So I highly recommend to try to keep everything really still and not to have your hand hanging in the treat pouch. If you were in our online or um, in-person class, you'll hear us say, Get your, get your hand out of the treat pouch. And that is why, because it becomes a big distraction. The dog's anticipating it, so now they're not listening anymore. All right. Oh, this is funny. So 
we keep hearing the word command versus Q. So Q versus command. So we just wanted to touch up on it. Um, no big deal if you use either one. It's just we wanted to say why we use the word Q. In the dictionary, command is, and it, you know, it just even sounds like a word of authority. It, it almost sounds like if you don't, there's going to be some repercussion. So it's even when you say, else. yeah, it, it does. It feels like I command you to sit. And it's even like, even your tone and everything, exactly. Versus when you're asking a question like sit, they just have two different tones. And to us, they sound exactly to the same, the same but there really is a difference to how the dog interprets this um, command versus cue. So in our dog training and the way that we teach our dogs, it is, it is an ask, it is a signal that says, hey, do you mind going into a sit? Now it's up to us to up that reinforcement, to pay them really well for them to choose to listen, but it's still a choice. And that's, that's the difference between a command and a cue. So over the next three or four weeks that you're in class, I'd love for you to try to use the word cue instead of command. So that's all. I think there's a little video on here that we just kind of shot together to kind of reiterate what command looks like versus cue. <laughs> and thinking about, you know, the commands that we as humans get versus the cues, right? A cue would be the light turns green, you know that your car should move, right? That's just something that we've all learned that's a cue for us to go at this point. Um, a command would be your boss demanding that you get there at 7 a.m. and you better be dressed and happy and all this stuff, right? That doesn't elicit a super excited response from me as the person. But if they said, you know, Would if you they mind? set everything up, yeah, and then they texted me in the morning and promised donuts and that kind of stuff, you know, I'd probably show up a little faster and a little nicer. So, um, now we're gonna get into breed groups. So last week we talked about um, how there are seven breed groups that the AKC recognizes, but one of them is hounds. And since we don't typically have those in our city life, um, I sort of nixed them. If we need to bring them back in, we will. This week, we're gonna talk about sporting groups. So these, um, if you wanna go ahead and click to the next slide, these are your spaniels, your retrievers, your pointers and your setters. So these are hunting dogs, well, typically bred to do hunting jobs, um, work on farms and ranches. So these dogs are meant to move, but they're also intensely loyal that they love to, to solve puzzles to accomplish a task for the area that they're in, whether that's going and finding and swimming out to go get a duck to bring it back or it's searching through your garbage because they've been left alone all day and they're gonna find that smelly treat that you left in there. Um, they are focused, focused, focused. So it, a lot of times they'll call them stubborn. Um, that just means that they are uh, passionate. Right? I am also stubborn, um, but it also gives me a drive for work that Yo will tell you when I come in, I'm ready to go, right? And so these dogs, once they hook onto a task or a job, they focus in and it's very difficult to get their attention elsewhere. So this is why they need a lot, a lot of practice. If you're going to be off leash, they get hyper focus onto different kinds of things. Um, they're also, they will come up with their own jobs. If you do not provide the right amount of mental and physical stimulation for these dogs, they will bark, they will dig, they will run in the mud and then splash it all over your house. We see it all the time. And it's not them being dumb or mean or stubborn, they're bored. So for these particular dogs, we wanna definitely incorporate a lot of fetch, maybe some water sports or swimming, um, scent work, Anything they do really well in scent work. Yeah, they do really, yeah. really well in scent work because they're used to going and finding something to bring it back. Um, so for these particular dogs, if you'll click to the next slide, this is the kind of breed specific enrichment that you wanna look into for dogs that love to use their nose and their mouths. Um, so labs, pointers, setters, they're always up in your face and slobbering all over everything. Let's give them something to do that's a little more productive than drool all over my couch. 
talking about snuffle mats, IQ balls, um, retrieving household items. Uh, Yo taught Bentley to go and find her keys on a little leather strap and then bring them back to her. So that's, these dogs are made for that. Let's go ahead and give them some kind of enrichment that stimulates that part of the brain. Let's see, oh, whoops. So last week we talked about what the difference between spa, place, crate, go to your bed, mark and table. And we um, specifically showed you how to train all of them and know what the NB behavior is before you put it on cue. And remember that you're not gonna add the cue until you get that final behavior, whether it's sitting, um, going all the way down, having two paws on or going into the crate and laying down. So. For today, we're going to expand on that by adding distance. We talked about it a little bit earlier. Um, going to the bed. So for this one, for me, means going to the bed, laying down, whether my dog's head is up or down, that's his option. But he gets his mark, his click, when he is laying down and his hip drops. Um, and sometimes like I'll delay the click and wait one or two seconds after. So once your dog is going to the spot and once your dog has it on cue and once you've added duration and some distractions and you've walked away and you work the clock, now it's time to add distance of when you're going to cue that. To begin, you want to start really close to the dog bed. So you're going to walk up to the dog bed. You're going to say the cue. You're going to wait. And when the dog lays down, you're going to click and then you're gonna reinforce on the bed, and then you wanna release the dog to come off the bed. And every repetition, I add about a foot each time. So I start like, I walk up to the bed, but I stop one foot away from the bed and then cue it. So here's my foot, go to your bed, click, treat to the mouth or between the two paws, and then I release him and he gets up and I toss the treat just to get him going. And I add one foot for every success. So obviously go up or down based on if you go one foot away and your dog looks at you like what's going on, you know that you need to get it, go back and go back a little bit closer. So, so it's not a straight line. That's a really great point. It doesn't go one step, two step, three step depending on the amount of repetitions that you add in, you're gonna level up or level down. If your dog is really having trouble or it's distracting, you may be at that one step for a, a long time, but that's okay. We want that first step to be the most important and then we can get further and further away. Any questions on this? How many of you have, have got a really good go to bed with your dog and you're ready to add this? Are we jumping ahead? Is this good information? Go to bed place, crate, chair, Spot. any of those. Yeah, we'd love to let us know if this is um, helpful for your dog at your level or if you guys need us to go back a step. Um, we, we need the feedback to know how to help you guys the most, so let us know. Does anyone have a go to the bed at a distance or go to your crate at a distance? Go ahead and just type that up in the chat and uh, let's see. We've got a couple Q and A's here. Still working on the bed with treats and Indy knows settle, but not quite go to bed. Okay. Do you know how to teach the difference between settle and go to bed there? Settle is harder than go to bed. Right. So um, taught exactly the same way. You're just going to cue a different word. That's all. All right. Carla, we will go into that one-on-one um, -on -one during our transfer session. That's a great next topic. And then we'll add in a little um, Aria knows crate and settle, but we're still working on bed. She does love her bed in the living room though. Um, and we will add something in a little extra for next time. But those of you who want to advance or uh, lower the criteria, let us know in your transfer session and we'll give you a little more individualized attention. Oh, this one's for you, Joanna. Um, in KPA, we would sometimes, we would actually in our school dogs too, we'll put out two settle mats and a table and if there's two of the same objects, so in my house, I have three dog beds. So if I'm too far away from the first bed that I was working on, I actually have to point to which bed I want him to go to. So if you have two or three of the same 
cues for different beds and you're too close to them, like they're in their proximity, you do need to add a point. So it'd be go to your bed and then you'd point to which bed. So um, does that make sense? Okay, I think so. All right. Foundation skills, sit down, release, and target. So uh, Julie, I'm gonna let you get started. And if I'm gonna do a demo, I'm gonna go set up that iPad. <laughs> okay. Yeah, um, so foundation skills, these are the skills that we use to build upon to make any behavior chain, to make any um, of our stays and downs longer. Uh, can, you, can you go back a little bit? Go back to the slide. Um, and then targeting. So what we're, what the other thing that we were talking about, um, having the dog bring a part of their body to whatever you're presenting. Um, the importance of all four of these skills, we're going to, even if you have just the very basics of them, we're going to build upon that. But for those of you who have come to class before and need a little higher of a step up, we also really want to encourage you to add in that release. We I know I say it a lot, but I definitely don't hear it from other people a lot. Um, the, that releasing their do dog from a sit or a down, it really takes the place of the stay, 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 right? My dog knows to sit until I've said something else. Um, and I've done that by making sure that I've captured a really strong release. And release doesn't mean you have to get up and follow me. It just means shake out that very stiff position, whether it's down, sit, um, or even settle the release word just means freedom. For targeting, we're gonna to talk today about how to move your dog with the target. Um, it's okay if everyone in this class is at a different level. So we have brand new puppies in here that are under uh, 10 weeks old. It's okay that you can't do this for an hour long. It's okay that anyone can't do this for an hour long. We're building upon our foundation skills to make sure we have success at advanced level. And any athlete would tell you that the same thing is important. So don't try to start off with a 50 foot stay when your puppy is so young and you've only practiced it twice, right? We wanna make sure that we're building at an appropriate level at an appropriate pace for your dog. You ready, Yo? We'll see. <laughs> okay. So uh, Yo is going to show you how to use the lure, a lure into a sit or a down, um, how to capture it and how to capture the release. And then we're going to talk about targeting, moving your, bo your dog's body. So not just sending them to a fixed point, but actually using your target to move your dog around the place without having that treat in your hand, which so many of you get in trouble for. Um, Thor is good with his settling, working on distance and distractions. Good job, Tori. All right, do you see me? Yes, we can see you. Go for it. Okay, so what do you want me to do first? A lure to a sit? So she's going to show us luring for a sit and a down. All right. So toss to reset his position. To lure him, she's going to put the treat right up to his nose and hold it upwards. Oh, to go uh, to go down, she's going to do the same thing. So for up, we want to pull the dog's nose up so that the rear goes down. For down, um, we're pulling the face down and putting the treat a little bit back towards their shoulders um, so that they really, <laughs> Bentley said to show off, he's showing play dead too. Um, so. For the sit, we're bringing their attention up. You're not dangling it over their head. It shouldn't be mistletoe. You're actually pulling their nose with that tree up so that the rear goes down. Um, and then show us luring a down one more time, yo. While you're down there. You want to get rid of the food as fast as possible, but it looks like this. Then, really. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good. All right, targeting next. Yeah, so show a targeting down. So targeting to move your dog without actually having to move yourself. You can 
get your dog to go pretty long distances actually with you just standing still if you're using your hand or a targeting stick. Um, I taught my dog with a wooden spoon, so I was able to extend my target another three feet past me. So targeting is how we teach, uh, going around, doing different tricks, hopping into a down. As you can see, her finger is going down and Bentley is following her finger. So it works the same with luring as it does with targeting. She just doesn't have that treat in her hand. So if you are using the treat, you wanna phase it out pretty quickly, the first two or three, and then we're gonna take out that treat and use our hands. Um, otherwise, we're gonna use targeting because it's such a useful tool, especially for those of you who have big dogs, like I do, to move them um, from one room to another. This is used in zoos and aquariums for really large animals too. Um, we're gonna show you the release. So Bentley's got a good sit. And then this is how you're gonna capture the release. Okay. So she's gonna make a little bit of movement and as he's moving, naming that release, okay. So okay. she's gonna get him to move a little bit. Yep, okay, move, click or yes, and then toss the treat away. So he'll go into his sit. Good boy. Okay. So if your dog's not automatically, Bentley has this release word down. If your dog's not automatically responding to the word, you'll notice that Yo's gonna make a little motion or you can toss the treat to release. So, okay. um, yeah. I'll do it yet. So if your dog doesn't have this down yet, if it's a brand new release word, we're not gonna say, okay. We're just gonna get up and move, mark it, and then toss the treat away. Um, this takes the place of the stay, the, the okay. leashing for long periods of time. So Bentley just goes from a sit to a loose up. It just means that he can break that real strict structure um, for the time being. Good job. And yes, Jessa Bentley is a ham. He was really showing off this morning when we turned the camera on too. It's funny when, he, when the camera's on, he like turns on. Otherwise he's just like, okay, I'm sleepy. So he's a, he's a superstar for sure. He loves to perform. All right. Jump prevention. So there's, oh, what, did I miss something? We have a question. Uh, can you repeat that for a new dog? For a new dog, you're not going to say the release word, okay. And then expect them to move. We're going to help them move and name it, okay, then yes, and then toss the treat. So once they've made their body free, we're gonna start naming it, okay, release, let's go, but picking a consistent release word. I usually say something like, you wanna say the cue that you want to use to release them, number one. Number two, you might need to bring in some help. So you'll bring a helper cue that helps them get up so that you can mark the getting up behavior. So you still want to use the release word, but add on a helper like get. Get is one cue that we teach a lot of puppies. That means like get off me or get away from me. Um, it, we teach it by bringing a treat to the dog's nose and tossing it two or three feet and it teaches them to move. So a lot of the puppies that are in our school program, including yours, um, does have that cue, um, has that behavior on cue. So you would say, okay, wait one maybe two seconds if they just kind of look at you like what do you oh, yeah i don't know what that means then go ahead and help by tossing a treat while you say get so you're using the get cue toss but you're still going to click right you're still going to mark that getting up all right hope that answers your question cool cool all right jump prevention and problem behavior jumping. They're both the same. So when a dog, when, when your dog is young and they're really, you know, they, they're, they weigh like eight or 10 pounds or maybe 12 pounds and they're cute and you just can't help it. A lot of pet owners, 
pet their dogs while their two paws are up, whether you're sitting on the couch or you just walked in and it feels so good to pet them while they're up because you can bend over and reach them. However, um, it does teach your dog that the, that they should, that they can be reinforced for jumping. And a lot of owners then try to backtrack, you know, when their dog is 60 to 80 pounds and they're like, yeah, that doesn't feel good anymore. So as much as you can, you want to manage. So if your dog is still pretty young and you're still implementing some, some routine, um, you could use a leash to manage them not jumping on someone and telling the person that they're potentially going to jump on, hey, can you cue something else that keeps their paws down like sit? Or, hey, don't pet them until they've got four paws on the floor. Totally up to you. So I usually tell, anything else, Julie? Yeah, we all know that those people are going to go, I don't care. I have dogs. They're cute. I care. This is part of being a puppy or a dog parent is advocating for your own animal. You would not let someone come up and grab and shake your child that was a total stranger. So let's not let them do that to our dogs, especially, especially if our dogs have paws on other people because that can turn into something dangerous really quickly with my dog, 80 pounds. Um, we were not consistent when she was a baby. My parents loved to pet her when she was jumping. Um, so that became a real, con, you know, consistency issue. And now she jumps out of the blue. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but um, she could have knocked it out when she was a baby. So that's the, the important part of being proactive, not reactive. Don't, don't start when your dog has a jumping problem. Don't start when your brother comes over to the house and that's her favorite person. Start day one in your house with you guys coming in the door and then you can go from there. And I think we have examples of that. So if you already have a dog that's jumping, go ahead and put that in the chat. Just say, yeah, my dog jumps. Tell me when, or tell us when your dog jumps. In this video, we're gonna talk about when, they, when someone's coming into the home and they wanna greet them. So it's a friendly jump. We're also gonna talk about like, if you, everyone's already home and you left to go get something out of the car and you're coming back in the house and you're about to open the door. So there's two options. Option number one, ignore until you get the better behavior that you want, the behavior that you're looking for, which is just four paws on the ground. Not necessarily having to sit, because sit, sit is hard and challenging, but saying four paws on the floor, okay, I'll take it, let me start petting you here. I sometimes, like Julie's dog is really strong and really heavy. So when I see her, I'm like, okay, let me prepare. <laughs> Um, I don't wait for the, um, so someone's commenting. I don't wait for her to stop jumping on me. I literally have scratches on, uh, on my tummy from the other day from another dog that jumped on me. Instead, I cue the behavior that I want before the dog gets to me. So timing is everything. If you got a really athletic dog and they're like whew, running towards you across to like in the beach or something, you're not gonna wait for them to put their paws on you. You're going to be cueing that six feet away, sit, right? Or touch or something that gets their body back down low. So here's this video on greetings. Cue the, go ahead. Puppies don't have the momentum that they can stop on a dime. So those of you with puppies, they are wobbly, they're awkward, they're lanky, so um, cueing them in plenty of time also helps their body go, oh, I need to slow down, because I know my puppy hits the wall all the time because he's just running so excitedly that um, he loses track of himself. So. so literally, this is a video we shot yesterday, and this is how Opal greets me if I'm not prepared, right? 100%. She comes out bolting, but I cued it and she's, she's only two feet away from me and I cued it and she's like, oh yeah, I got that. Um, I also had the food ready. Um, that's another thing is just be prepared. If you've got, if you're in training, I cued it a little earlier and she stopped even farther away from me. I came up and I reinforced the behavior that I wanted. And then I called her back so that we could have another repetition cycle, right? It's not always the first jump and then it's done. For Opal, it's sometimes the second or third jump that's really gonna hurt you. Um, it's when people aren't paying attention because they're like, oh, we got done with the first one. 
So for her, especially, it was important to practice that going up, coming back, going up, coming back, um, so that we had the amount of repetitions until around the fifth time, and she just sat there like, okay, I'm done now. Um, it was actually really, I was shocked <laughs> that she did it so well. So Yo cued it enough that, uh, or she cued it early enough that it surprised me as the owner that her butt went down like that. And she was able to come up and give her some pets. So I and if I'm that. really consistent with that, if she goes, oh yeah, she's going to tell me to sit, I'm not going to have to cue it anymore. Instead, she's going to run up and she'll go right into a sit. But until then, I'm going to have to cue it. Um, but you do notice that Julie is managing the ability for her dog to actually make contact with me by putting her on leash. So using a leash to practice this when it comes to greetings to strangers is really important or a pet gate if it's you. And here's off leash, he's cueing it a little bit sooner and we're doing pets because the dog really just, this is Cooper that just wants to be pet. So we're cueing it. And then we have the, when you walk in the door. So you guys that are, you know, going out to your car really quick and your dog's like, where are you going? and you open the door and they're right there ready to jump on you. This is um, highly recommended. You come in, you either open the door and cue it, or you open the door and you present the food where I want you to be. So here's a little video, the rest of the video on this. So here she cues it, sit. Her dog's like, oh, I wanna be pet by you. <laughs> and here's her coming out with the food not up high, right where the dog's mouth is. It keeps the dog's paws on the ground. And you'll notice that Julie's holding the food in her hand. She's just not giving and leaving. She's holding and pinching that food to keep his, his butt, you know, keeping his paws down on the ground. All right. Homework. So your homework um, for our advanced students, especially, we want to see a sit or a down with a release. So I think Indy made it to about 13 steps in our transfer session the other day until we, uh, and he had a really great release. I want to see you guys practicing that instead of focusing on a stay, focus on a really solid release and that stay will come automatically. Um, so send us, you know, a clip or a video or a picture of how far you get. We'd love to see um, maybe even a little challenge if any of our advanced dogs want to take that, take on that challenge. Um, going to your bed spot place, with, from a distance. So just like how Yo showed us, um, whether it's a bed or a place or a specific spot area in your backyard, um, show us how far you can go, how far you can get away from it so that you can send your dog to that area. So Joanna yes. put on here, Zena has a place cue from about 12 feet away with low distractions. So um, the 12 feet away is great. I would start adding more distractions one thing that I do is if I have a helper, like you've got your husband, is that while you're away and you're cueing it, you can have your husband just like walk in the room. So there's people walking by, there's presenting a toy, you know, tossing it. Um, really, really hard is rolling something on the ground as a distraction. I usually like to add the distraction while I'm walking back to pay the dog. So after the click, after the mark, then coming back to pay them, I would add a distraction because a dog knows that they're going to get paid. They're more likely to stay there than to go after the distraction. Cool. Um, making Try or make your own enrichment feeder. We had a couple that um, I got a chance to post on our social media. We have plenty more coming. Whether you, you know, find a new one at a store and try it out or uh, you want to make one from home. We want to see your creativity and how your dog solves, right? Every dog's going to do it a little bit differently. So we want to see how your dog thinks and what they use to really get into that reinforcement. Um, and then again, we are a small business. We love, really love your engagement in our social media, Facebook, uh, YouTube, uh, Instagram. We would love, love for you to follow, tag, like, share, all of the above. Um, to help us out during this, this period. We're obviously all going to be stuck inside. We want to continue to bring you guys the best and up-to-date 
yeah. content that we can. And the only way that we can do that um, is if we have the support from the community and our engagement of our students. So thank you so much for coming out and, and checking in on us today. And if you're not already in the private Facebook group, please let Yo or myself know we will invite you as soon as we can. We do have some time for some Q&A. So if you guys would like to uh, put down some questions that are either relevant or not relevant, we'll try to answer them over the next few minutes before we sign off. Julie, can you see the questions? My cursor is off. Perfect. Yes, I can. Melissa said you guys are doing a great job with the videos and classes. That's not a question, but I'll take it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank um, you. No, Anna, what if the distraction is the reinforcement? Interesting. Zena's biggest reinforcer is her ball, but it's also her greatest distraction. So to build up to something like that, I'm going to let Yo take over because she has a good answer. So uh, I would lower the reinforcement. So if the reinforcement is the ball and then the ball is a distraction as well, use a different reinforcement like food and then the ball could be used as a distraction at a larger distance. Right. So like I like have Jesus much further away from where you're placing your dog, placing Zena, and then you're going to mark. And as you walk back to pay her, he pulls out the ball at a very big distance. And then progressively, he's going to bring the distance of the distraction a little closer each time. Again, working maybe increments of one foot. And if that's too much, then you're gonna to go to six inches and you're gonna go further you know, forward and back. So for my dog, it was tennis balls. And I literally had it for his like final, like one final I did, I took out a whole big thing of tennis balls and dumped them while he was on his bed. But at first I started with one tennis ball really far away and he was like, oh my God, oh my God, can I go? And um, eventually I was able to progress to the, just throwing a bunch of tennis balls while he's staying in his dog bed. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, Melissa, this is a really specific question about your dog in particular. So I'm gonna actually send you a private message about that. I don't know if anyone else is having well, I'll ask, is anyone else having puppy biting or chewing issues? If so, we're happy to go into that now. Otherwise, I'm going to send you a more personal message on this particular question. We did answer that in the puppy start, right? We talked about going from human play to, to introducing toys so that we can get the dog to stop biting on our clothes and bite on the toy instead. So we can definitely answer that as a group or we can just... Um, well, the question is, how do we stop them from biting when he's taking, when we're taking him away from something he's doing and he doesn't want to stop? So one, manage the access. Obviously, he's getting way too into what he's doing and then he's getting upset when you guys want to take him away. So whatever he's doing, having it managed and practicing recall while he's exposed to um, whether it's him chewing on a, a bone, we really shouldn't be taking the bone away from him while he's chewing, uh, especially as a puppy, because we want to encourage him to keep going. But if it's something naughty that he's doing, like he grabs a tissue and you take it away, that's a management issue. That means that you need to be more on top of him with a leash or tethering, um, baby gates, we want to make sure to manage that access before we decide, is this a problem that we need to completely reshape? And with puppies, I would say about 90% of the problems we come off across is a, is a management. But so to, if you need any other clarification, yeah. To quickly answer you is if we can change the way your dog feels about your hand, if you ever bring your hand out and it doesn't have something in it, you're teaching your dog to avoid you. And that's where you're getting some of the growling. Your dog is telling you like, stay away from me. So one way or another, whether it was you, another dog in your household or someone else, someone has gone over to your puppy and tried to take something from him. Therefore, naturally, and here's a human analogy that I used with Julie the other day. If I'm sitting there eating and every time she walks in the room, she grabs something and like grabs the favorite thing off my plate. Like every time she walks in the room by the third or fourth time, I'm going to be like, uh, no, you know, and then I'm going to be a little bit more and then I'm finally going to get upset and pissed. So important that your hand is never taking your hand is only giving. And for puppies, I, pres I would present it a little bit over their nose and shake it, make it interesting, 
pull it up high, your dog will automatically drop what's ever in their mouth. It's your job to grab that while they're eating or while they're taking or engaging with the new item. So again, we'll hit you up privately to kind of go over that in your setup, but that's a quick answer, I guess. Not really quick, but. All right, who else do we have, Julie? Uh, can the reinforcement be another ball if she doesn't care about food as long as the distraction ball is out? Yes. Um, yeah, as long as it's not the exact, I mean, if you're using a yellow ball, a yellow tennis ball and a yellow tennis ball, that's going to make things really difficult. But if it's a certain kind of ball and another certain kind of ball, you can kind of gauge the value um, of those two reinforcements. And one way to stop your dog from over going over threshold over every time they see that particular tennis ball is to do what I had to do and is have a lot of tennis balls out. So instead of putting them all away, you've got eight to 10 tennis balls all over your house. And now they're no longer that much of a big deal because the dog has it all the time. So if you want it to lose oh. its value. We have a good, really good question that we happen to solve the answer to this last week, but I'm going to bring it up again. Um, how can I enforce counter surfing, um, even when there isn't anything on the counter, he will still put his paws up. Yes, Thor is a five month old puppy um, who is just now realizing how amazingly tall he is. He's like, wow, this is what the humans see all the time. This is pretty cool. He's going to continue putting his paws up onto things just because he can. He's a dog. He's looking for things. He's an opportunist. But if there's never, right. Yeah, and they're opportunists, right? If you happen to leave a crumb on there one time, he's going to know because his nose is better than yours. So making sure that one, when he is in the kitchen, we talked last week about cueing a bed or a place so that his focus isn't up on the counter. He already has a specific um, area that he's supposed to report to and we're going to give him something at. Um, and then also just managing the access to the room, right? If you're not in there to supervise your puppy, they're either tethered to you or they're not in that room because they're going to pick things that you don't approve of. He's a puppy. He's going to stick his finger in electrical outlets and lick the you know, try to eat the toilet paper and open the fridge. If you leave your puppy alone in the kitchen, there, I mean, there's no counting how many things that they will choose to do, whether or not you see it or not. Um, so we making have three sure minutes that left. Um, yep. We'll post a video on our Facebook group uh, private page about counter surfing, but it's broken up into three steps. One, manage to figure out what the alternative behavior is. And then three, train the alternative behavior, and then you can get rid of the management tool. So we'll go, we'll post that video that we posted from last week and we'll kind of put some text over it. Super, super common problem. My dog is doing this right now. He's five months old. Um, it's something that every dog is going through when they start to realize how big they are and how much they have access to. So um, don't feel alone in this. It's happening to most of us. Any other questions, Julie? Um, I don't see any other questions, but please feel free to reach out to us, whether text message, email, um, or you just want to follow up with us. And if you have any topics specifically like counter surfing um, that you guys want to go into, we'd love to add it to our next class and shoot you guys some videos. So let us know. All right. We have Rowdy Rover next. So if you want to dive deep into working with reactive dogs or dogs that have reaction to um, other dogs on leash. We've got some video that we're going to analyze and Joanna starring Joanna and Zena. So yeah. um, if not, thank you guys again so much for your support. We really enjoy putting this together for you. So have a wonderful evening and we will see you. Um, by the way, our other new classes that are coming on are interactive. That means it's you and your dog and we can see and hear you. So there's a CGC class on Thursday that's kicking off. And then we've got Saturday tricks class. Um, that you can earn a title. So AKC is allowing us to give the titles to uh, participants as long as you submit video in exchange for seeing it live. So two fun classes that are gonna be interactive. But anyways, thank you very much. Appreciate you guys so much and thanks for your ongoing support. Please share, hashtag, or use the at sign at caninelearningacademy.com. All right. See you guys next week. Bye. Bye.
Okay, I'm gonna stop share. All right, Julie, see you later. Okay, I'll see you in a second. <laughs>